It's September 5th, 2003. We're interviewing for the museum. John Tucker, who just celebrated his 100th birthday, and his daughter, Ellen Herrick. I was working then at uh, the, uh, the boat yard over in Wilmington, if I remember correctly. When I was working there, before I was married, I had just a, a, a helper's job. I was a big kid for my age, and I could work there. And so after I worked there a year, I must have started out when I was 12 or close to that. And I hit the boss up for a raise. I figured that I ought to be worth more than that. He says, I will tell you, kid, I think you are. But he says, if I gave you mechanics wages now, I'd have all these mechanics quitting on me. And he says, you go away and get yourself a job for a year and come back. And, and he says, I'll give you mechanics wages. So that's exactly what I did. I went away and got a job at Ford Garage as a mechanic. And I, I wasn't a mechanic at all, but I got by with it. And the, the boss there helped me out. So I worked there a year and then came back and he gave me mechanics wages. What we were doing, when you bought a Ford there, you had to put your own assessors on it. So most of the job that I did was to saw the instrument panel off, which really didn't have anything on it, and put a speedometer in. I mean, uh, the cars then didn't come with speedometers on And that was the biggest job. And the uh, other job was Ford had three bands. and. Uh, the one foot pedal was low, and if you let it back, then it was indirect, which was high. And the other was reverse, and the third one was the stopping, was the brake. Well, so my job was either to put speedometers in or uh, put new bands in, because in the early days, these Ford bands, people wouldn't hold their feet on the uh, low, pedal, low pedal long enough or hard enough, and they, you'd wear the lining out. Okay, what brought us here was Grandpa worked here in 1877 as manager of Frank Whitley's sheep. And in 1892, my grandmother came over to babysit the Whitley children. And Grandpa fell in love with Nana Bessie. And they were married on a boat called the Nellie, which was Whitley's boat. And the Falcon pulled it out to sea because evidently there was no wind. And after their marriage, they moved to the mainland. They did not stay here. In 1919, Grandma had read in the paper that Wrigley was putting lots on sale at Catalina. And they had visited here when their children were small and rented houses and what have you. But when they saw this article that Wrigley was putting lots on sale, Grandma got really excited. And she told my grandfather, when, uh, would you like to buy a lot in Catalina? And grandma's, Grandpa said, sure. And she said, and I have the money. She had saved money that the girls had given her who were working and still living home from their work. They would give a certain amount to Grandma, and she put it in the bank. Now, Grandpa would never have allowed her to do this if he knew that she was doing it. So she had the money to pay for the lot. 
And then Grandpa said he would build the house. He was a, a builder, and he worked for San Pedro Lumber Company as manager, and he brought the lumber over here to build the house. And this is the house where we are right now. And this was built as a summer home. Dad came over with Mom, and they used to come over before they had my brother and I, but the first summer that mom had my brother, she started coming over for this good part of the summer and with me the same way, and dad would come over every weekend. He was willing to make that effort. And he has some funny stories about when he came over one weekend that was before my brother and I were born, they had locked the downstairs and the sleeping was upstairs. And so he couldn't get in, so there was a, a eucalyptus tree on the side of the house, which has been cut down. And he went up the eucalyptus tree and crawled in the porch upstairs. <laughs> and, and he was able to go to bed that night because he was, it was quite late. And I remember stories that Grandma, before the girls were married, uh, because I didn't, they didn't start getting married till about 22. Anyway, when they came over with their boyfriends, Grandma would hang a sheet between the boys and the girls, and Grandma would sit, sleep right there. <laughs> and the girls slept on one side and the boys on the other. Anyway, those were cute little stories that, um, and, and we spent every summer of my life from the time I was a year old over here and three months of the year we were here I guess when polio was bad my dad said he did not want us to swim in swimming pools and if we would not swim in the swimming pool we could be in Catalina three months and he'd come over every weekend and he did so were you here at all during the Second World War oh yes we came over, it, they didn't say passports, but I remember, and I wonder, you know, you had to get a passport and come over. And I remember the ship being painted gray, and it was kind of dismal, because, you know, I was used to the white ship and the music and dressing up, and, you know, it was kind of sad. Can and, I add something? Mm-hmm. Lover's Cove had never been swimmed in, or not hardly at all, until these girls uh, came over, and they found a spot where they could get down to the water, and they took the, their children and went over there every, every day to swim. That's what and Amy and Mom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were the first Lover's okay, Cove. Okay, I'm through. <laughs> Now, did you ever work on the island or just? My job, and I was young, and it's probably hard for people to understand in this day, but I had no more than a high, uh, ninth grade, eighth grade education. But anyway, I was uh, working for a Marine company that was servicing boats for yachtsmen and called Fellows and Stewart. And this was a story I was telling there about if I came back why he'd hire me as a mechanic. And of course he did and I was very young at that age at that time and I'm not sure the age, but I think I was only about uh, maybe 14 years old. Anyway, at that time, I don't know if you ever heard of the gambling boats off the shore of Wellington, but uh, for some reason I was lucky enough to get a job with Hall Scott Motor Company. There again, I doubt if you've heard the name of the company, but it was a big engine company, 
out of Berkeley and they supplied engines for uh, Boulder Dam. Boulder, well, it was, they supplied the engines to the uh, International Harvester Company that built trucks. And uh, they, they, their trucks built the Boulder Dam with these engines. So it was a big live wire company and did a good job. What she asked you is, did you ever work over here? Yours was more volunteer to look at the engines well, of the different fire truck. You didn't. You volunteered work, but you well, worked Well, la later on, the the, the uh, fire trucks came into the picture, of course. And the Blanche W had a whole spot. The Blanche W, uh, way back then. They had a, I think it was a 12 cylinder in line inter, uh, automatic intake valve engine that they used as what was available uh, when the Blanche W was built. But by this time, those, that engine became obsolete as far as doing the job right. So they took, they took the big engine out and bought a Hall Scott from me, and, and which was a, it was two engines, of course, a twin screw, and they were 200 horsepower apiece. With three to one reduction, that's a, way it was possible. These engines turned 1800, but 1800 would have been too fast for the uh, propeller, so uh, they had three to one reduction and swung these great big wheels that the slow speed engines that they took out swung, but they could do it with a three to one reduction of the engine that operated it 1800 RPM. But what you're saying though, Dad, you did, you came over on a weekend and you'd look at it if they, or you'd listen to it and it, you'd troubleshoot it if they needed well, help. Well, after, after I sold them the engines, <laughs> I, they didn't have mechanics here to, to do that, so uh, the operator, and I was trying to think of his name anyway, uh, that uh, operated the boat why I'd come over and listen to the engines and make suggestions for whatever I thought at the time. That's it. Yeah. Well, the so, fire engine, didn't you work yeah. on that too? Did the fire engine, you worked on that, didn't you? Yeah, because the fire <laughs> engines, uh, to begin with, were ad inadequate and all. And they finally, when the war was, I don't know if it was, yeah, it had to be over. Anyway, they had engines that could be bought from the government, very reasonable, and all, and even fire trucks that could be bought, very reasonable, with Hall Scott engines in them. And of course, I helped the poor fellows out there was one deal that came over that had uh, the uh, ignition system to the spark plug. They had it covered with uh, metal to uh, so that they wouldn't uh, make a noise. And this is going back to where these were used in uh, in. Uh, war. Anyway, I would help them tune their engines up so that they'd, because to find mechanics to do that sort of thing. Anyway, that's... That's what, what he did when he came over. He And he loved doing it. His volunteer, it was his joy and his pleasure. You so told me something about fig trees going up. They were planted in the golf course. 
No, there were some that went all the way up to the mausoleum. Just about. There were some in the golf course, too. But huh. there was both. And when we yeah. would take our walks, yeah. and I was growing up, we would pick first the, the black mission came in. After that, the white fig came in. And yeah. we'd bring them home. Yeah. And Nana Bessie loved having them for breakfast with milk on them. And yeah. she would have her figs cut up in a bowl with a little bit of milk on them. So yeah. we have stories, too, if you're interested. Um, Go with it. Frank Whitley, who was the one that owned the sheep and had the home, he used to bake, evidently. And when he baked... He would say, get me the flour, get me the bread, or get me the salt, get me the pan. And then he'd bake the bread. <laughs> and everybody, you know, Mr. Whitley is baking bread. It, that meant that you were saying, get me this or that, or whatever you were doing. If you didn't really do it yourself and you were asking everyone to help you, my mom or my aunt would say, oh, Mr. Whitley is baking bread. <laughs> the other story that... I think is connected, or I'm sure is connected with Catalina. The first son of Frank Whitley and Lucy Brown, oh, excuse me, of Lucy Brown, it was before she married Frank, she was married just like uh, he had divorced Adargo. Anyway, he, re he married, his second marriage was to Lucy Brown, grandpa's, my grandfather's sister. She had a son by her first husband named Antonio and grandpa said that Tony he used to call him, would row him down to the isthmus and back they'd go to a dance and the reason he'd row him keep do that was that grandpa used to say Anton you row so well and he said Anton would just <laughs> row all the way down so when you tell someone or compliment them on what they've done, they laugh and they say, Anton, you rose so well. And hopefully you will continue doing it. But those are the two Catalina stories that are connected to the real people here. You also mentioned the clothing, the way your grandfather dressed and your grandmother. He, Grandpa, always went downtown with a coat, a vest, a tie, and a hat. No matter now, what time. And, <laughs> and to prove that, uh, he went to the ball games when they were here. Oh, yeah. And he was dressed the same way. And there's a picture of uh, mm. the. Well, we have one. Uh, yeah, a it's of in the museum, too, of Grandpa sitting there watching him. All by himself, but he, he loved ball, baseball. And Didn't he know Wrigley also? I think so, yeah. It was high because he was here, you know, during the years when there weren't that many people and they knew each other. Didn't he have a nickname for him? Brownie. Yeah. Hi, Brownie. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, you, you think back and, gee, in Los Angeles it was the same way, too, though. People knew each other. You walked down the streets of L.A. and they knew one another. Uh, I think you mentioned about the way your grandmother dressed too and her she never, hair of her yeah, skin. She never let her arms get out in the sun. She either wore a little sweater over her arms and she wore a dress and a hat and she'd go down and watch his swim. Grandpa used to go swimming with us, believe it or not, and he was very thin like dad only even thinner and he wore the, those funny suits that they wore you know that would cover like a, the whole body <laughs> he'd go in that water with us I can remember that couldn't believe it and he was you know like in his 80s so he lived a long time too yeah he was he didn't know it but I found his baptism and he was 91 when he died, but he was still going swimming in his 80s. His, you know, it, 
evidently they didn't have good records and what have you. And when he married my grandmother, she was 14. He thought he was 26, but he was 33. Because when I found the information from the baptism, he was born in 1859, baptized in 18, June of 1860 in the Plaza Church, and I was able to get that baptism. How <laughs> neat! Oh, yeah. that's wonderful! Yeah, it, it, you know, it's fun. How I, did you get food and everything when you were here? Oh, they had, Shag and Hoover had stores, but when they were here, like, in the early days, they cost, they must have gotten boats over here, but a lot of it, maybe they did a garden or something. You know, they had boats coming over. Did you bring food, or did, I know Middle Ranch, didn't they grow some food? Yes, or they, they did. Anyone? Well, when we came over during the summer, I don't remember other than supplies once in a while. Well, there, there was a store Shags. down here. Hoover's. Hoover's store was right down here. And a bakery. Do you Have you heard about the bakery? Oh, you could stand there and watch them bake bread. And, you know, midnight and after, they'd be baking bread. And we'd go to the dance, and we'd walk back, and a lot of times they'd have some of the, the things cooked or baked, and you could buy fresh rolls, and you could smell them all over. You could smell them, you know, almost halfway f to the casino, you could start smelling the bakery. Did you tell her about where the dance hall was? You mean the pavilion, the first one, or the no, casino? I'm the first one over here. Yeah, well, the pavilion lodge and is where the first and thing And there wasn't any island out there or anything flattened out. Early pictures here. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Let me take a good picture of it and you can tell us about it. And there's some of the boats. That and there's see the glass mm -hmm. bottom boat here coming this way? Well, I don't know. There's a pavilion where you could dance. That's not a real accurate picture, but that's... Uh, right here. here a, yeah, and here's another pavilion. Right there you can see it. It's the round thing. And I think they use that for the bird park. I but you see, in order for the, the uh, casino. casino to be built, See what they had to do to the mountain there? They had to eliminate that. Flatten it. Yeah. Now, you danced at the casino? Oh, yes. With the family. I mean, we'd go up there, my grandfather, my grandmother, my cousins, my mom, my dad, my brother, myself, friends. And we'd sit in these seats, which they only had that were like um, theater seats. And then I dance with my grandfather and my dad and my brother and my cousins. We were we had enough right there that we didn't have to dance with. You know, we weren't waiting. And that's when I was real little. I can remember how much fun it was and how exciting and how slippery the floor was. <laughs> it was it was really well polished. Now, do you remember how much you paid? Well, we were free. I think there were nights that were free for a family. And we would probably go up a lot of times on the free nights. But it was very nominal, like 10 cents to get in or 25 when you were an adult. I'm not even sure it was that much. I, you know, it was Wrigley, I think, it was a hobby with him. And he, a lot of the costs of the street sweepers and the men that went around, the Mexican players, I think he sponsored those because I don't, he loved the island and he wanted, it was like a hobby. So, he put money into it. And you might, I think it's interesting that you were able to come over here about until he was 98. Wow. Oh, yeah, he was here. Wow. During the summer, by yourself, 
just the summer months yeah. until you were 98. And then last year was the first year I came over and we celebrated your 99th birthday. I have pictures. And I was here, and I said, this is where we have to be. I can't, you know. He was going back and forth to Dana Point on a boat. How, uh, how I got across uh, during the summer months uh, when I went to the dance and even just to get over here was uh, the yacht. I was working for Fellows and Source and finally coming. And... Uh, the yachts would get tuned up, and the wealthy people in those days didn't have as many days off either. And so they'd come down and uh, get aboard their yachts, and sometimes there's something need to be done to them, and they'd bring them into Fellows and Stewart's, or, well, it was mostly Fellows and Stewart's and get them tuned up. And I would work on the boats to get them tuned up. And I'd agree to work if they'd take me to Catalina after, after I got the engines running. <laughs> and then during, after the, I don't know exactly when, but you'd the water taxis would come over late Friday night and yeah, you used to climb on those water taxis and those were rough. That, that, that was a business for them. They, they run water taxis over at night and then in the daytime to uh, bring the paper over, oh, the yeah. morning paper. But remember, and those were the water taxis that they used in the 30s for the gambling ships. Yeah. They were the same ones that they, I guess, sold to some. They, they made these ships, uh, these little boats, uh, that haul about 45 passengers. They made those to take people to the gambling ships. And I was involved in that because I sold the engines that would go into these uh, water taxis, and I was pretty deeply involved because they they had to run without breaking down, and so they had to have normal service that took so many hours before they needed to be overhauled, or otherwise they'd break down or something. And so... <coughs> When I was working as a mechanic in in that era, why uh, we'd give an engine so many days or hours before they needed overhaul, and they would bring the boat in on the last run, and we'd start tearing the engine down, and by daylight we'd have the upper crankcase, it was a big hunk of iron, and in those days we just had enough men that could lift us out of the boat and carry it up to a truck that was waiting for them and take it into Los Angeles to have all new bearings put in and a line board and brought back down and then usually get it back down, taken early in the day and then get it back down by uh, they get it, they get it back down that evening yeah and, but it, and, and we'd start putting the engine together and uh, by the next day they had it we had it back together and running and back on the run yeah but if you I remember you would be up all night. You would yeah, even get to right. come home on some sure, occasions because they couldn't afford to not have the water taxis running, the gambling ships. So you'd be up all night. Yeah. And I recall, you know, when Mom said, well, your dad had to be up tonight. Take what care. Him? It was a different world in those days. Uh, they some way got rid of them. I mean, you know, they what? were, th the gambling ships, they were 
supposed to be far enough off the coast, but some legal reasons they got were able well, to get rid of them. Uh, some of the uh, people ashore, the city was fighting to have the gambling ships run away because they didn't think people or it was right for people to waste their money on gambling. Yeah, and they attracted the wrong. Long Beach didn't like that yeah. crowd that was there. So. And they finally, they finally won. Yeah, that's how the, I recall they got rid of them because legally they went through. Well, the reason they were a success is for some of the service work that uh, I told you about. Yeah, but but they they really people were still struggling in the thirties, and I guess that's when they were at the height, and people were going out and gambling away <laughs> all of their salaries, and I mean it's like anything else. But I guess they figured. Like like Las Vegas. <laughs> Horse races. Did they have very many cars? Did you work on cars when you came over? No. <coughs> Not here. <coughs> no, everybody, they had a big parking lot. Everybody got down there some way. But to get out this. No, she's talking about here in Catalina, Dad. Did they have many cars? No, they didn't. No. Very few. I'm trying trucks. to remember. I remember trucks. People walked, rode horses. We walked in, and I remember I was the youngest, and um, no empathy. <laughs> My legs were short. No empathy. If you cry, you can't come the next time. <laughs> so I, oh, I was sure I didn't. I fuss. I had to take three steps to the one sometimes, but I. I wanted to walk, and we took walks every afternoon. They wanted to be sure we slept that night. And so after a nap or a rest, we'd get up, and they'd walk us up the canyon or out. You know, so we got our exercise plus our swimming in the morning. <laughs> now, what events do you remember? Did they have the 4th of July parade or what big event? No. They didn't have a 4th of July parade when we were growing up. No, I don't think so. The events were family-oriented. Uh, we played cards. Um, we were at the beach together and did a lot of swimming together. And I can mention the baggage place. At the end of the pier, as the stuff come off the boat, that was baggage when it went in there and you had to come back up there and pick up your baggage and even your uh, vehicles that you took on the boat you had to turn them in at a certain place and then uh, when you got over here you had to pick them up at a certain place. We always had a wagon and then my brother and my cousin uh, decided they could make money pulling bags, which they did. They went down with the wagon, and uh, people would pay them, you know, per bag or yes, or a car, a, bag, a wagon full. And I mean, they would go, up, but they made pretty good money for young ones. That was a big business for them. Now, your grandfather physically built a house himself. Yes, he did. He did. And it was one house with the kitchen down here and two, a sleeping porch, or a porch, I guess, an open porch here. Well, the kitchen the, went the from kitchen, here back. Kitchen and dining room and all one. Yeah, from one here meal, back. Even the hot water heater was in there. And the sleeping porch was upstairs. I mean, everybody slept in this big room. It's still one big room. The people, Aunt Amy's family, uh, but kitchen was added on, and Dad changed, and Mom yeah. changed this where the bedroom's in the back and the kitchen and living room here. This was an open porch to begin with, and then it was enclosed. Yeah. Even Mom and Dad lived here from 1973 till now as a permanent residence. That has still remained a summer Family. Yeah, retired over and here. now there's five owners of 
monsters because of the deaths of family in the family. And um, and they got a calendar, and we've made this into a condo down in a condo up. So you lived here permanently since 73 when you retired. That's right. mm -hmm. Before That's they right. were coming over, you know. They actually did the uh, new rebuilding it and fixing it yeah. 69 to 70, you know, off and on. They threw yeah, these it. windows and all. My dear wife, she wanted big windows, and I think she's the one that got these big windows. After the war, the happiness that I felt, the boys coming back and coming over here and just having fun. I mean, it was unbelievable, the joy that was here. And a lot of them would come over and work in the summer, and then because of the GI Bill, would go back and in the winter go to college and in the next summer they'd come over and work again. So it brought a lot of people to Catalina. I mean they were looking for places to have fun. Were you here when uh, the war was over? Oh yeah. Every summer. 46. But I mean the actual day? Um, the day it was over, that first summer after it was over in 46 I was here every summer, you know, and I had just started uh, USC, and so I was here in the summer, and I was working, and then winter, but the joy, I mean, the fun, you go to the casino, there were so many young people there, it was a fun time, yes, and the beaches were jammed, volleyball on the beach, they allowed, it, we had courts on both of the beaches, and you go down there and you play volleyball all morning. And water skiing was in. Uh, I had a friend who brought two speedboats over and we would, I was fortunate enough to go water skiing and the, that's when the Miss Catalina went out to meet the steamer. It was, it was a very upbeat time. Can you figure out how a bathroom and toilet facility was made years ago. Cesspool. Well, uh, would you believe that upstairs in an area almost as big as from here over there was the bathroom and toilet, shower bath. And would you guess how the floor was? It's five inch thick concrete. There was one upstairs and one downstairs. And after I retired over here, outside of fixing up the downstairs, was to take that concrete out. And that turned out to be quite a chore. We took gang showers. I remember that. We'd all go, the women would all go in there. <laughs> <laughs> and the shower would come down, the toilet's right here. The shower come because, you know, it didn't matter. Then you'd swish it down the water. And how I got that out of there, it, it took me a couple of weeks to get each one of them out. I had a diamond drill, and I'd peck, peck, peck until I got a place this big, and then I'd bust it out. And then I had a, a wheelbarrow up there that I'd put the, the stuff in and wheel them down the stairs. 